We're going to talk next about improving your brain health at any age with Dr. Roger Landry. Stay tuned. Who's in charge? The independent man. John DePietro. News Talk 630 and 99.7 FM WPRO. And Mr. DePietro, who is in the eye of the storm. Hello, Rhode Island. You listening? Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Patricia Raskin. I'm filling in for John DePietro this week. And today we're wrapping up uh, this week of being here. And we have a great segment for you. I'm speaking with Dr. Roger Landry, who's an MD. And his book is called Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging. His book has been endorsed by the AARP and was a 2014 top pick in Moore Magazine. And we're talking about improving your brain health at any age. We often think many times that, you know, as we age, you know, things are slower and they're not as better, but is not as good. But uh, that is not always the case. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the opportunities we have as we age, particularly with our thinking and with our brain. And I want to tell you about Dr. Landry. He's a retired, highly decorated full colonel, former chief flight surgeon at the Air Force General, Surgeon's General Office in Washington. He's a preventative medicine physician who has spent over a decade smashing those stereotypes of aging and redefining the possibilities of older adulthood. And we're going to talk about neuroplasticity, which is that magic word for brain health, and how. Uh, what are some fitness tips to improve our brain health at any age. Welcome, Dr. Landry. Well, thank you, Patricia. Well, Happy New Year to you. Yeah, you too. It's great. I had Dr. Landry on my show, the Patricia Raskin Show, on Saturdays, which is at 4, and it was just such a great topic. And I'm very interested in this, Dr. Landry. I'm writing a book about aging and how we can follow our passion at any age, and we need to use our brain for that. Absolutely. So, That's kind of the, the core function we need, isn't it? Yeah. Um, tell us, why do we have this feeling? I mean, why is there so much ageism about you're going to get older, you're going to get slower, you, your memory won't be as good, you won't be able to do the things you did? I mean, some of that may be true, but please speak to that. Well, our knowledge of aging has only uh, come of age, so to speak, within the last few decades. Prior to that, we, you know, we all felt that it was just luck or serendipity, or, or most of us felt it was our genes. Yes. So that to the extent we were able to choose our parents, well, then we could we could have something to say about it. But we didn't think we had a whole lot to say. But starting with the, the MacArthur Foundation study on aging, which uh, was ten years long and came. Uh, without with its results around the mid nineties uh, and then everything thereafter, it has just smashed the stereotype of what aging is about because we've learned that lifestyle and the choices we make are the major determinant mm. in how we age mm. and we're seeing a lot of people in their fifties and sixties you know starting new businesses, starting new careers, um, changing their life, starting new hobbies, traveling around the world. Well, those boomers are just not going to have any of that ageism that, that is out there. <laughs> the yeah. generation before them was, uh, you know, they accepted it. That's what they heard their whole life. They had very low expectations. These boomers, however, uh, given just how they run their lives, but in addition, having all the new information and yeah. science and research, yeah. and, and uh, it's totally changed their expectations, yeah. and it will totally change our society. All right. Well, let's talk about that. And, folks, we're taking your calls about about brain health, about positive aging, uh, anything you'd like to know, we have the expert on with us. My guest for the whole hour is Dr. Roger Landry, and his new book is Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging, and he's a renowned aging and preventive medicine physician. Okay, and the number is 438-WPRO-438-9776 or 800-321-9776. So, Dr. Landry, let's talk about this big word. Okay, there's a big word called neuroplasticity, and that's the word for brain health. What does that mean? This is just a fascinating word, but more importantly, it represents a concept that has uh, we have only recently learned. And uh, it has changed everything because neuroplasticity, it, it really, it refers to the brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new connections. And this is throughout life. Neuroplasticity, it, it allows the neurons in the brain to compensate for injury, mm. 
and disease and to adjust the brain's activities in response to new situations or a new environment. That is phenomenally new and optimistic stuff because basically what it says is that we are the architects of our brain. So, so wait, so what I'm hearing you say sounds again like back to the future a little bit. What I'm hearing you say is that if we have a health issue and we look at that and we keep doing what we're doing and we stay positive and we believe that we're going to get better, that we actually can get better? That is what the term uh, says. That is what the research points to. Now, we're not Pollyanna about this. It, it can make things better. It can, in some cases, eliminate the disease. Mm. In some cases, make it dramatically better. But, you know, I think the most dramatic case is uh, is very well known it's uh, jill bolte taylor she's an author but she was a harvard uh, a neuroanatomist and she had a stroke at 39 and she uh, uh chronicles her experiences in her book my stroke of insight great t- great, mm, great title and basically uh she lost uh, physical function uh, the ability to speak the ability to walk but she knew as a neuroanatomist that to the extent that she worked extremely hard, those brain those brain cells were gone forever. But what she she knew is that to the extent with neuroplasticity, if if she had high expectations and she worked very hard and she did all the things to keep her brain healthy, that she was hoping she could overcome it. She is a case where she totally did. It took her eight years, but you can see her out on the on the speaking circuit now, yeah. and she just appears normal. Well, I have to I have to share a personal story because I think this is very apropos. So about, I'd say about a month ago, I I got some pain in my hip. It was a piriformis muscle issue, a hip from my sciatic nerve. And I'd never had pain like that, and it was in the right hip. So it it, it got, it it really uh, exacerbated, it got really strong. And so I went to see an orthopedic surgeon, and this is so interesting. And he takes an x-ray, and he walks in the room. Now remember, this was the right hip. He walks in the room, and he says to me, oh, he says, you know, I'm really sorry. He says, you don't have a great left hip. I said, what? What? Are you, what? I said, what, what? This is my right hip. I'm fine. I swim. I don't have pain in my left hip. And so then he explained to me, and he said, well, because of your exercise, your attitude, he says your weight, you know, it's the proper weight. He said you, the function of your hip is not good. You know, you're starting to be bone on bone. But because of what you do and your lifestyle, you don't have any symptoms. Keep doing what you're doing. And that was so amazing to me because I didn't even know that that hip was not good. Yes. Well, let's go back to the brain. I don't like to separate the brain out, but, you know, for clarity and for, you know, to get the information out, it's sometimes necessary because this is all together. It's our body. It's who we are. But there's an example of the brain. It comes out of a, a, a nun study, and this is also a book. And But basically, these nuns, uh, when they died, were uh, several of them were found to have Alzheimer's disease, and yet, you know, with the, the tangled nerves and the beta amyloid deposits and plaques, but they never had symptoms. And when they looked, they led a lifestyle that was very physically active mm-hmm. and very mentally active. Mm. And in, and it and we have learned that even if we have a gene for a disease, mm-hmm. lifestyle can put that gene to sleep so that it never expresses itself. So the disease may not even show up. Or if it does, as is with your hip, that's not so much a genetic thing. It's, it's you know, just life. Uh, we can indeed uh, not experience the debilitation or the mm-hmm. impairment that someone who perhaps uh, has low expectations would feel. Yeah, very interesting. And we may have something like, for example, I, I, in that left hip, there is mild arthritis. But, you know, I knew that, but I just kept doing what I was doing. And so because of that, again, the symptoms really in a lot of ways disappeared. I mean, I don't think I can walk 10 miles on that hip. But, you you know, you do. I, I think what you're saying is you adjust, you understand it, and you keep moving on in the best that you can. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here with a huge cast on my <laughs> left lower leg. I had an ankle replacement. Now, mm. the, the, the injury that caused the need for that happened four decades ago. And I was essentially, you know, un, unimpaired for three decades. Mm-hmm. And then I began to feel some uh, some limitations. But again, I adjusted. I was positive. I, I was not going to accept anything less. However, it got to a point, and the technology was such that now we could replace it, that uh, I was much better off thinking about the the future 
and the fact that I have to keep moving if indeed I want to age successfully. And therefore, I took advantage of that uh, technology up the road in Boston, and bingo, uh, I'm expecting that... uh, you know, I've got a I've got an ankle that's going to keep me going now rather than limit me for another few decades. Right. All right. Before we go to break, what are some fitness tips that will help improve our brain at ever any age, which is going to also help improve our attitude and our physical abilities? Well, the first thing is 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 the is the basic fact that moving, and I, I I'm reluctant yeah. to use the e word because a lot of people get kind of put off by the word exercise, but just moving is associated with remarkable uh, brain function, maintaining brain function, and so just moving. So, uh, and it doesn't have to be heroic. It doesn't have to be running marathons, just moving regularly every day. And And, and I just want to say something about that, Dr. Landry. I have found that I might be in a bad mood or something might have happened or upset me, and I will either swim or I'll exercise or walk, and within an hour, it's like I'm a different person. It's amazing. Absolutely. We see it biochemically now. Uh, we were able to assess what's happening in the brain biochemically and uh, electrophysiologically, what's happening you know, with the messages being sent. And yes, there's a response, and it's a very positive response to moving. Our brains are part of our body. Our body must move in order for everything to function well. Every, every system, heart, GI tract, mm. as well as brain function, all right. is better when we move. So... Uh, I, you know, I, there's do whatever. You can go to the gym. You can run. You can do uh, the heroic things. But as a minimum, get out there every day and walk. And I recommend that you uh, get a pedometer and uh, and then just increase it in small steps, uh, maybe 10 percent a week or something like that. Just a few more steps. And that itself as a basic can is enough. So don't feel intimidated. You have to get the right clothes, join a gym, do all that. That's all good. But just realize that you're not on the outskirts. You're not able, you're not a, an outlier and not able to benefit from this it is, as long as you can just move. Okay, we're going to take a break on that note. When we come back, we are talking to Dr. Roger Landry. And he is talking about how we can improve our brain health at any age, which helps us improve our overall health. His book is Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging, which has been endorsed by the AARP, is a gold medal winner in the 2014 Living Now Book Awards, and was a 2014 top pick in More Magazine. And we're going to talk more to Dr. Landry. We're taking your calls for anything about successful aging, um, increasing your, your brain, your brain cells in your life, and improving them. We're going to talk all about that for the whole hour right here on 438-WPRO, 438-9776, toll free. 321 WPRO, which is 9776. You're listening to The John DePietro Show, and I'm Patricia Raskin filling in. Right here on News Talk 630 and 99.7 FM WPRO, we're the voice of Southern New England. We're taking your calls, and we'll be right back. John DePietro. He is entertaining and informative. He's John DePietro on News Talk 630 at 99.7 FM WPRO. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Patricia Raskin filling in for the John DePietro Show this week, and we're wrapping up uh, with a great topic. We're talking about brain health as we age, at any age, and uh, how we can just get better. uh, My guest is Dr. Roger Landry. He's a renowned aging and preventive medicine physician. He's president of Masterpiece Living and author of Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic and Successful Aging, which has been endorsed by the AARP. Welcome back, Dr. Landry. Thank you, Patricia. Okay, so we talked about moving is one of the first steps in improving your brain age. Well, we've got three minutes, so we'll cover, and then we'll come back after the break and finish. So what is our second step in terms of fitness tips for a brain. First was moving. Okay. Well, uh, that first step has to do with the fact that the brain is part of the whole body. So, I mean, that moving is also associated with, you know, with the right diet, 
and uh, so that we have to have the right nutrients there. And we can go into more detail, but uh, you don't want a whole lot of fats in your diet. Let's just say that. The second one uh, is is also attentive to the, the whole body uh, relative to brain function, and that is sleep. We need sleep. At night, it's like a vacuum cleaner goes over our brain like a big hoover, and it takes out all the damage during the day, the, the oxidated uh, byproducts of just normal life and normal function during the day. And we have to get rid of that if we're going to function, and the brain needs that sleep to do that. It's very critical, and, uh, you know, we have uh, in some segments of our society the fact, hey, I can live on just a few I hours. I was just going to say that, Dr. Yeah. Lee. You must have read my mind. I was just going to say to you, I have people bragging, oh, yeah. three hours a night, and I'm yeah. fine. I'm cool. Yeah, well, they think they are, but their brain is <laughs> screaming out for uh, for a little more so that they can function better. Not only the brain, but the entire body. We need that. I mean, there is, you know, what's the number? I don't know. It's it it varies, but most people, most experts in the area say, you know, usually around you know anywhere from six, seven, eight hours. Some kids, mm-hmm. of course, who are growing need even more. And uh, so, uh, but to think that you can live on, say, anything less than five. Uh, uh, you know, regularly, chronically, that is uh, that is a fantasy. You and say it's you, going to catch up with you. It, it yeah. is definitely yeah. catching up yeah. with you. Maybe begin to accept less uh, function as normal for you, yeah. and you would be surprised at what you might have, particularly with your brain, if you yeah. have a little more sleep. All right, we're going to take a break, and when we come back right after the break, we're going to talk to Dr. Landry about three other fitness tips to improve your brain at any age. You're listening to The John DePietro Show, and I'm Patricia Raskin, filling in this week, and we're wrapping up this hour with talking about brain health with Dr. Roger Landry, who's the author of Live Long, Die Short. He's received numerous awards for the top pick by AARP, by Moore Magazine, and he's a renowned aging and preventive medicine, medicine physician and president of Masterpiece Living. Again, stay tuned. We're right here on News Talk 630 and 99.7 FM WPRO. We're the voice of Southern New England. We'll be back right after the break to the top of the hour. John DePietro. He is entertaining and informative. He's John DePietro on News Talk 630 and 99.7 FM WPRO. Hello, everyone. We're back. You're listening to the John DePietro Show. And I'm Patricia Raskin filling in. And we're wrapping up for the week. I've been here since Monday. It's just been wonderful. And we are talking to Dr. Roger Landry about how to improve your brain health at any age. Because, folks, when you improve your brain health, you're improving all of your health. Dr. Landry is a renowned aging and preventive medicine physician. He's president of Masterpiece Living and author of Live Long, Die Short, a guide to authentic health and successful aging. His book has been endorsed by the AARP, is a gold medal winner in the 2014 Living Now Book Awards, and was a 2014 pick in Moore Magazine. Dr. Landry is a retired, highly decorated full colonel and former flight surgeon and Air Force surgeon for the general's office in Washington. So he has really spent decades talking about smashing these stereotypes of aging and really redefining what it's like as we're older. Welcome back, Dr. Landry. Thank you, Patricia. Do you, do you know that I read somewhere talking about as we age, and I, I believe I read this, that people that are over 60 now, there are more of us than people 20. Uh, there's no question that uh, the percentage of the population that is over 60, 65 is going to only climb up to uh, probably in within a little over a decade to 25 percent of the population. Mm-hmm. So depending upon birth rates and perhaps immigration, that is probably going to be the case. Absolutely. Amazing. Fastest growing uh, segment of the population yeah. right now is the uh, over 100 group. Really? Yes. Our centenarians. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Centenarians. Wow. <laughs> Well, I hope to be one of those. That's all Me I too. Say. That's yeah. my plan. Me exactly. too. <laughs> all right, folks, we're going to give out the number, 438-WPRO, 438-9776, 800-321-9776. Your calls for Dr. Landry. Anything about brain health, getting older, getting better, aging, uh, how do you stay healthy? And so we're taking your calls. All right, so we talked about the five, you, you have five fitness tips to improve your brain at any age. The first one was moving. The second one was sleep. What's the third one? 
The third one is uh, has to do with uh, how, how do we get the most from our brain, and, and that is to learn, of course, to use it or lose it. But more importantly than just using it, it is learning new things. Mm-hmm. This is the critical component mm-hmm. that we have learned. Sure, if you do crossword puzzles, you, you do things that you're good at and you continue to do it, that's terrific. That keeps those neural pathways open. But the important thing for us in a healthy brain is to learn new things where we actually make new neural pathways, which kind of create creates like a redundant system so that if we have to take some hits or something happens, this seems to protect our ability to function. So so when you say learn new things, would this be read a book on a new subject? Yes. Of course, it can be a big deal. Like learning a language, we can scan oh, yeah. brains and we can see brains get just larger and larger mm. as someone learns that or an instrument or something. But it doesn't have to be that that large. It can be something as simple as eating with your opposite hand. It is, it's about going to a place that you always go to a different way. Mm. It's about scaring yourself by doing something new, just yeah. challenging yourself. Yeah. Uh, the, the words I use, be a beginner. If you are a beginner, you don't that. have to. You don't have to become an expert like you thought you were when you needed to be when you were young. You're not going to the Olympics with this. Just be a beginner. Try something new. Whatever it is, something that pleases you. You, and you know, it. I have to tell you, being a baby boomer and you know not growing up with computers. I mean, I really had to learn a lot, and that my brain is not isn't geared that way. And yet, it has really stretched my brain, and I'm surprised at how much I can do. But I really had to learn, and it's it wasn't familiar to me. Well, good for you. And this this area in particular is critical because, you know, isolation and, and lack of connection with society is, is associated with very high risks. Someone may not like the computer, the, the way we deal with each other or the phones or the texting and all that. But I'm telling you, if, to, if you're not familiar, at least with the basics of it, you're going to be uh, you're going to be on the margins of society, mm-hmm. isolated and it's associated with a lot of risks. Mm-hmm. So please don't let that happen. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to do it all. And it doesn't have to dominate your life, but I would be aware. So congratulations. <laughs> well, I, I have to for my work. <laughs> I, mean, I, really, <laughs> I, know. I really do. But now I'm learning how to do graphics, which I've never had to do. And that, that I'm trying to leave to other people, but when they're not around, I have to do them. <laughs> I can see that brain pulsating. And yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it gets tired. Yeah. Um, all right. So the third one was um, learn new things, right? Learn new things, yeah. All right. The fourth one. Use it. The fourth one is has to do with this 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 thing that is prevalent in our society that we have become accustomed to and we don't really understand how toxic it is and that is stress. Stress. We think that you know the world is stressful by nature. The fact is there we have a frenetic pace of our society, but stress unless there's a tiger about to jump on you, is self-induced because it is all how we look at things. Sure, there's a lot happening, but to the extent that we focus on our to-do list or worry or regret, this produces stress, which causes our body to react with emotion and it causes destruction. And we can actually see it in the brain now that people who are stressed, certain areas of the brain, those associated with frequently with Alzheimer's disease are negatively affected. So what what do we do? I mean, we have stressful situations, but there's only three things you can do. Either you fix it or make a plan to fix it, whatever it is, that you walk away, just leave, get away from it in your mm-hmm. life, or accept it, which mm-hmm. is probably the one most common. And mm-hmm. that is going to make all the difference. Well, I, that- I have to, I, Doctor, I have to tell another, I have to share another story. I have to, because this is so, this really amazed me. I, I want to give an example of exactly what you just said, which I don't think I really realized until it happened to me. So I'm going back to the hip issue. So the hip was like 75 to 80 percent better. I was so happy doing all my stuff. Right. And then I had an upset. I remember this vividly. And I really started fretting and worrying and got very fearful over this upset. And I remember sitting there and just feeling like helpless and hopeless. Within four to five hours, my hip totally kicked back in. It got almost as bad as it was, and it took me another two weeks to to get that better and I said to myself I'm not doing this to myself again I'm not because there's nothing you that worry doesn't do anything and Classic. so but I want you to I did want to mention it because I was amazed at how that, it went right back that, to the beginning that is an excellent example Patricia that worry 
uh, sort of stimulated that piriformis yep. muscle again, yep. which, which irritated your nerve, and there you were back to you know back to mm. your impairment. So we need to find. You know, I ask artists usually when I give a talk. I said, "What happens when you're drawing?" I said, "What happens to time?" And they said, "There is no mm. time." Yep. You know, you can't be stressed if there's no exactly. sense of time. And I say, and and you know, how do you feel? And they say, magnificent. So we have to look for those things, and it's all different for all of us. Is it nature? Is it music? Is it art? Is it is it just walking? What is that we being with a pet what is it that kind of shuts our chattering mind down that makes time go away because that's when we can break the momentum of stress in our lives which will make all the difference it'll come back but as long as we have those outlets to break so that doesn't just continue to grow very important they're very important for all of us to really understand and to have some discipline around our brain you know at some point you have to say to your brain stop it i'm not listening we're not going there (laughs) <laughs> We're in control, really. I mean, meditation, um, a lot of people think it's very sophisticated, but this is exactly what it's about. It's about uh, bringing yourself to this moment and not letting your mind determine uh, what what's going on in your world. Uh, you just you concentrate on your breath or you concentrate on a, a piece of art or whatever, and particularly your breath, and that sort of shuts down that chattering mind, and you can feel a peace and a contentment mm. and a joy. Yeah. And what that does for your brain, your body, for your whole outlook, it's magnificent. Yeah, absolutely. And and when you said you lose time, and those are things we have to think about. What are the things that we love to do? For me, broadcasting, I lose time. Or when I'm writing, I lose time. You just, you you lose time because you're so involved. Yes, yes. And you love it. That sense of timelessness is, is, is the best therapy for whatever ails us. To get that, whatever it is, that sort of makes you lose track of time. All right, so we have... The five tips now to improve your brain health, moving, sleep, doing something new, stress management, and number five is what? Well... Um, it goes back a little bit to uh, what I was saying before. I said uh, to make sure that you're expert, that you're not fatalistic about this whole thing. That uh, you know that when you get the first sign of uh, maybe a little memory glitch or or something uh, that maybe you just didn't function, your brain isn't functioning quite as well today. That you immediately go to the worst scenario and say, "Uh oh, it's happening. I'm on the di- I'm on the decline." And you you lower expectations of what, what what's possible and what's happening, which stress and all of that so don't be fatalistic be optimistic so you know and when those memory things hit that's a that that can be a, a surprise to us but you know when I poly in or uh, as we get older our brain functions a little differently but it does it does not mean when you begin to have a little memory thing like remembering a name that this is a, a downward slide what it, it requires is that you make accommodations and there are many that you can make to do that mm-hmm. All right. So again, um, number five again is don't be fatalistic. Set high expectations for what you can achieve. Yeah, interesting. And but again, those expectations have to be within reason too. How do you know when it's too high or it's within reason? You just know when you got. Oh, you know, this is a great day to be talking about this. <laughs> New Year's resolutions. I I challenge your listeners and you, Patricia, to tell me, have you ever made a New Year's resolution that is now part of your life? Very rare is that the case. They they're they're doomed to failure because they're usually too big, too ambitious. And the Japanese have a way to make changes in organizations, but but in lives. And it is by simple baby steps. So say I want to lose some weight. So uh, what we should do is think of the smallest step that we can take towards losing weight. You know, maybe we want to lose 20 pounds. Well, if that's the goal, that's too much. And it Mm -hmm. sets up a whole response in your body that makes it fail. But if you say, what's the smallest thing I can do towards Mm -hmm. doing that? You may say, I'll take, I'll spit out the first bite of a candy bar. I'm going to do that for a week. So the smallest step, make that the goal. And then each you know, each week or yeah, whatever, be, uh, make a very small step, the goal. Because you're moving, you right? You're yeah. moving toward, you're moving That's forward. A, it's exactly right. Who says, I mean, we're, we in America has, you know, we, we talk about heroic goals. We need to be able to brag about them. The way to make change in your life that sticks and that is achievable and where you cannot fail is to make little baby steps. If you fail, you say, oh, 
that was too big a step. Mm-hmm. And you just ratchet back a little bit. Mm-hmm. And you mm-hmm. what you do is develop confidence and competence that you can change. And those are the changes that stick. So right. whatever you're going to do for the year uh, relative to your brain. So you do want to learn the guitar. Well, okay, you can do that. But the first step should be, you know, just, you know, you know, very, very simply, just make noise, and uh, and then think about it. But you know, on a smaller level, you know, you uh, if you're going to read a book, you don't have to grab the War and Peace. Or if you do, <laughs> <laughs> or if yeah. you do, say, I'm just going to read a few pages a day, and mm-hmm. and then continue to grow on your goals as to what you want to achieve, and uh, mm-hmm. that's the way it'll happen. Mm-hmm. So exercise regularly, number one. Challenge yes. your brain, number two. Learn new yes. things. Learn to reduce stress, number three. Yes. Unplug Asleep. regularly, which is again, again, part of the stress management. Unplug, yeah, it's related to the stress thing, and sleep is in there. And uh, above all, uh, don't be fatalistic. Don't set too low a goal, but also as you're making changes, don't be heroic about it either, and make may realize that small changes in little bites are the way to go. All right, we've got a couple of minutes left. So we talked about New Year's resolutions. How can people find you, and if they would like to write you a question or ask you a question and find your book? Oh, sure. No, I would, and I welcome it, really. Uh, the website where all this can happen is uh, livelongdieshort.com. And on that, you can get other you know, little videos, little vignettes, little uh, additional things. You can ask questions there that I will answer. And uh, I think you'll enjoy the, the website. And uh, you can also get what I call fireside conversations, which are regular updates uh, on uh, and little bits of information, little motivating things. And those can come regularly, and you can sign up for that on that website, uh, livelongdieshort.com. All right, and um, also Masterpiece Living is a whole program. So if people want to know more about activities or lectures or different things, they can go. That would be on there as well. Yeah, Masterpiece Living is about changing how we age in this country and changing the cultures where we live and grow in our cities and eventually public policy. That's a whole new group I'm working with. It's magnificent. And if you want to know about that, that's uh, mymasterpieceliving.com. Very exciting. All right. And my guest has been Dr. Roger Landry. He's a renowned aging and preventive medicine physician and president of Masterpiece Living. His book is Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging. And again, you can log on to livelongdieshort.com or uh, masterpieceliving.com. My Masterpiece Living, correct, Dr. Landry? That's correct. MyMasterpieceLiving.com. Right. All right, stay on the line for a minute. Um, I want to wish you a happy new year, Dr. Landry, and so happy that you were with us today. Thank you, Patricia. Thanks for what you do. This is, this is excellent, and uh, I hope people uh, internalize it and, and realize that it's a pearl. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I really believe in it, and I, you know, the best is yet to come, right? And and what you're giving us hope is that, you know, we can get better as we get older. We don't have to get worse. Absolutely. The people who are less stressful and most content are those who are older. Interesting. It is indeed, yes. Interesting statistic. All right. Um, Thank you so much.